know, this whole conversation about the global gag rule has gotten to the state where we must bring into the argument the pro-life, you know, uh, proponents. And the thing here is that if the woman truly, uh, as everyone has argued, has a right to life, what about the fetus? What about the baby in the womb? Who cares for the life of that unborn child? These are just the dynamics we'll be exploring today on VSA. Welcome, I'm Suleiman. You know, after the global gag rule was reenacted and expanded by President Donald Trump, so American clergymen described it as the most significant policy initiative on abortion taken by the United States. It was greeted with praise and positive comments by a section of the American populace who said taxpayers' money shouldn't be used to fund abortion in Africa or anywhere in the world. In Africa, some pro-life advocates uh, gave an open support to the global gag rule. According to them, the Mexico City policy is itself a means to snatch the freedom of an African woman from her. Arguments with a strong basis around culture, religion and the law were made for the global gag rule. Now, these advocates say abortion is a crime in most African countries. They say it denies a woman of her right to give birth when she's pregnant. But the impact of the GGR, that's the global gag uh, rule, uh, according to others, uh, was far-reaching and heart-biting. Now, these two schools of thought need uh, to be heard. And this is where we get to its core. Joining me today to discuss this issue are Rose Wakikona. She is a senior program officer at the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, and Charles Kanjama, advocate of the High Court of Kenya and managing partner, Muma and Kanjama Advocates. Lady and gentlemen, good to have you on VSA. Now, many people have spoken about the ills, you know, and negative impacts of the global gag rule. Has it helped Africa in any way? I'll start with you, Rose. Well, I hope, uh, Rose, uh, you can hear me. If you can't, I'm asking if, uh, you know, uh, if the global gag rule, looking at the negative impacts of the global gag rule, if it has helped Africa in any way. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, yes, I can hear you, although the network is just a little bit poor. In terms of the global gag, gag rule and its impact on Africa, I think it has been greater and far-reaching than we actually had realized the first time round. Uh, first of all, because this gargoyle didn't just target abortion-related services, as was initially thought of, but it actually also targeted uh, other services like uh, the treatment of malaria, the treatment of COVID-19, the treatment of immunization, and so many other ailments that uh, actually attack women. So it, it, it wasn't just limited to services that are for abortion, but they were also services that affect the general health of women by and large. So in its effect, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Instead, it took away much needed and essential health services that people at large need and uh, denied them of that right to enjoy their highest attainable standard of health. Uh, let me go to Charles uh, Kangjama. Uh, Charles, you know, w when we started this conversation, uh, we were asking, you know, uh, looking at rights. Uh, you are uh, uh, a legal advocate. Uh, take us through, you know, this argument. Uh, the woman has rights. And some have also argued or asked the question, uh, who enforces that of the unborn child, or does it mean that the unborn has no rights? 
I think that's an important uh, question you've asked, uh, because uh, from a human rights perspective, we talk about the unity of all rights. You can't enjoy one right while another right is being violated. And we say that uh, the rights are uh, indivisible. But we also say that uh, there is a bit of a hierarchy in human rights. And when we talk of the hierarchy of human rights, the foundation or the most important right is the right to life. Because if you are not alive, you cannot enjoy any of the other rights. And so you have one uh, room of thought or one, one group uh, that says that because the right to life is the most important, uh, you cannot kind of like mediate or negotiate away the right to life for anyone on the basis of other rights, whether it is a right to health care or whatever. And there's another group that says that if you are denied health care, then ultimately your right to life uh, is being affected and will be taken away. So this is a debate that is going on globally. We know that in the Western countries, and this includes the United States of America, they tend to have more liberal perspectives, or you could call them progressive perspectives, in terms of human rights. But what we call liberal progressive only relates to first and second generation rights. When we come to third generation rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, it is we in the global south, the developing world, who tend to to be more progressive in insisting on a third generation rights, right to housing, right to shelter, uh, education, and so on. Now, coming to the specific question of abortion, uh, because the Western countries have a more liberal perspective, it is easy for them to want to spread their ideology or their perspectives to the global south. Uh, that is Latin America and uh, Africa mainly, and the Middle East, uh, and also parts of Asia, where we have more conservative approach to the question of the right to life. And, and our conservative approach leads us to uh, give greater strength and weight to the right to life of the unborn child. So the whole idea of the Mexico City policy was to say that uh, America should not uh, allow its money its uh, citizens' taxpayer dollars to be used to finance advocacy or pressure on the global south in matters of abortion or to change their laws or to make them liberalize in terms of allowing greater access to abortion. So it is, it is an authentic argument that uh, every Republican president since Ronald Reagan has upheld on the other hand, you have the argument of the Democrat presidents who normally revoke the Mexico City policy, where they say that we want to promote uh, women's health. And for us, we think uh, abortion cannot be separated from women's health issues. So there are camps on both sides. But I think the perspective from here, where we are in Africa, is we do not want cultural imperialism. We don't want pressure being applied to us from the West based on money or denial of certain opportunities based on our own domestic and sovereign positions on the question of human rights. Well, domestic and sovereign positions are very key, uh, uh, two key issues you, you've raised here, especially when it comes uh, to uh, uh, state parties and how uh, they, uh, you know, affect uh, or are they implement some of their domestic laws and try to also see that such are expanded or extended out of their shores. Now, uh, some of the things we have seen is that, uh, you know, NGOs uh, who help women with their sexual and reproductive health are also aware of, uh, you know, these rules to the extent, as you highlighted, it has affected those who are uh, caring for those uh, uh, affected by HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, and now the recent uh, pandemic. How has it been, you know, for these NGOs, if you will tell us, uh, you know, going through this knowing for all that uh, the key thing to survival or to achieving their main aim is funded? 
Okay, so I think uh, when we look at the non-governmental organizations in the space of human rights, including right to health care, you find, uh, uh, I would say broadly speaking, two kinds of NGOs. Uh, there's one uh, broad class or category of NGOs uh, for whom majority of their funding comes from Western sources. And then you find another category of NGOs operating in African countries where majority of the funding is coming from local sources. Uh, so for those uh, NGOs whose majority of funding comes from local sources, they have some element of freedom in deciding uh, where to put their program priorities. And for those NGOs where the funding is coming from foreign sources, they tend to be driven by the agenda of those foreign uh, aid agencies. So when those foreign aid agencies are interested in matters of reproductive health, then the local NGOs would promote the question of reproductive health. Well, when the uh, foreign aid agencies are interested in matters of electoral governance, the local NGOs will promote issues of electoral governance. So definitely, for those local NGOs that are linked to the foreign funding, they get affected by uh, whatever decisions are made in a country like the United States of America to give or not to give uh, funding. But from where I sit, uh, I think it is actually good that uh, our NGOs develop the ability to uh, generate their own local program priorities irrespective of the preferences of the foreign aid agencies. Let me, and let so me I don't so think sorry, it should at this have point, a significant just, impact. Just a moment. I'll come back to you. Sorry to put in here. At this point, I'd like Rose to jump in. Rose, you heard what Charles said, that uh, he expects the uh, local NGOs uh, to see how they can plug into some local uh, opportunities and uh, help, uh, uh, you know, stir up, you know, help achieve some of their key uh, objectives. How has that been? Can that work, knowing full well that uh, you, you also have uh, an NGO? Uh, thank you so much for that. I just wanted to point out that when it comes to talking about abortion and uh, the practice of abortion within itself, it's not a, a Western concept. I want to tell you that we have worked with women who have had abortions, and actually the methods they use are African-driven methods. They use hubs that are locally grown. This is information that has been passed on from woman to woman to woman. And I want to say that reproductive health will always be a priority in this world because all the 7 billion people who live in the world were produced by a woman and definitely the sperm that fertilizes the egg is by a man. So itself cannot be a priority. I think that is erroneous within itself. So sexual reproductive health rights will always, always be a priority. As for plugging into, into the local resources that are available for us as human beings or as Africans within our context, I think uh, when it comes to the after effects of colonialism and uh, the repercussions that were left behind that our colonial masters went back to their lands, that is not very feasible because we were left with uh, a begging mentality we are left with a mentality where we are always uh, kneeling down with our arms opened up so that our colonial masters can be able to provide for us. People are very willing and happy to organize and fund a wedding. They are very willing and able to organize and perhaps fund a funeral. But when you tell them that no, let us uh, organize and maybe fund uh, an NGO, <laughs> I, I don't think that is something that is going to work. Maybe if we are going to change the strategies or the ways that we are able to have fundraising drives uh, within the context of Africa. But right now, as it stands, I don't think that is something that can happen. 
I know in the West, they are very vigilant in terms of having their GoFundMe pages. And uh, people always come together to fund causes that they believe. But for us here, even our own politicians, we are not willing to fund them in order to stand for political office because we believe we should receive money from politicians instead of us giving them money to go forward and take on our causes. Uh, people do not fund uh, NGOs locally. They just do not do that. Most of the money perhaps comes from foreign agencies. That is a reality that we have. This, to this actually resonates uh, you know, across the continent. Uh, before we go back to Charles Rose, is it safe to say without Europe and America, or let's say without foreign aid, NGOs on the continent can't survive? Uh, it would be difficult to say whether or not they would survive. Africa as a continent definitely would survive, and maybe no, no, the I'm talking NGOs about the NGOs, NGOs not, not, not the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, is it safe to say without, you know, outside you know, help for the NGOs on the continent, then most of the mm -hmm. NGOs will cease to exist. I think they would morph into something else. They would morph into something else, but as they currently stand right now, I highly doubt that they would exist in the current context. Let me bring Charles here. Charles, you've just raised, that was why I had to stop you there, because you raised a very key uh, you know, point there, saying that uh, if the NGOs can you know, look inwards, so that, you know, inwards now we're talking about the continent, irrespective of whether it's Eastern Africa, Western Africa, Northern Africa, wherever they are, they should look inwards. But uh, uh, Rose has just given us a, a shocker there, uh, which uh, would seem as if, uh, well, the continent, uh, NGOs on the continent can't actually survive without outside help. I think that's a, that's a, a reality that is actually quite worrisome uh, because it means that uh, the NGOs we have in Africa, uh, even because of their need for foreign assistance to survive, are uh, then become driven to pursue the foreign agenda and and the foreign agenda may be very good agenda like when they push african countries to open up their democratic space but sometimes the foreign agenda may not be very good agenda for the african countries and it becomes difficult to discern because uh, he who pays the piper calls the tune so i think there is need for also some internal uh, reflection why is it that uh, African NGOs uh, cannot survive without foreign funds? And I, I think you remember what I said, I distinguish between two kinds of NGOs. There are those NGOs which are able to survive without foreign funds. I personally am involved in a uh, wholly locally funded organization called Kenya Christian Professionals Forum. We fund ourselves, we are professionals, we give some donations, we give some pledges, we're able to fund our agenda. And, and therefore, I think there are some local organizations in Africa that can fund themselves or get funds from local sources. But for those which are largely dependent on foreign sources, then they will have a concern. They'll not be effective in functioning, even where they're assisting the local people. The problem is when the foreign sources have a different agenda. For example, uh, one or two decades ago, when Hillary Clinton was the uh, Secretary of State, in the United States, she said very publicly that uh, American funds, uh, donor money, is going to be tied to promotion of uh, LGBT agenda. And of course, uh, African countries, most of them are quite hostile to what they were calling foreign LGBT ideology. But the Americans said, we'll give you money if you promote this ideology. Tony Blair, this was two decades ago, he said the same thing about the United Kingdom. So then the problem becomes, at what point, if you are wholly dependent on donor money, can you tell them I'll not accept your money because you are tying it to some priorities that are different to our local priorities? And that is the problem. So I think as we reflect on 
the global gag rule or what I call the Mexico City policy should also reflect on the culture of overdependence by African NGOs, some, not all, on foreign money. And what can we do to win off the African NGOs from the foreign money, especially where it is tied to foreign ideologies that may not be welcomed by the majority cultures in Africa. And you know, Charles, uh, it looks like deja vu uh, because uh, just uh, uh, recently, uh, President uh, Biden has said the same thing uh, uh, of Nigeria that uh, on LGBT, that uh, if you don't, uh, you know, uh, give such support, you get some sanction and even uh, withdrawal of funding and uh, such as even or deny of some visa uh, visas uh, to some citizens in the country. But again, uh, it, 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 it gives Philip to what uh, uh, you have just highlighted. Now, uh, 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 Rose, it, it, you, you know, <clears throat> uh, let's bring it uh, back to the table because we'll, we'll come back again looking at how the NGOs and what the African governments can actually do uh, to help the NGOs. Uh, you know, maternal mortality is still a problem in most African countries. And reproductive health advocates say that uh, quite a number of things uh, can't actually go on if they don't get support from, uh, you know, the government where these NGOs are domiciled. How can this trend be, you know, reversed? I think we need to take into recognition that it's not just NGOs which are fully dependent on our Western countries for support, but also our governments are, and that in itself is very worrisome and it's very bothersome. I'll give an example of my country where our health budget, our national health budget is 70% funded by development partners and only 30 percent is funded by um, by the government or by our taxes so to say because we are prioritizing things which are not supposed to be prioritized for example we are prioritizing the purchase of tear gas we are prioritizing the purchase of uh, what you would call uh, this equipment that helps you to tap into people's phones just in order to do the spying and things like that so our government prioritizes most of its resources in order to protect itself as a regime or to protect the country as itself, but it doesn't prioritize social economic services. It doesn't prioritize education. It doesn't prioritize health. So it is left to development partners to determine actually what are the priorities for a country when it comes to perhaps the health budget. Right now we are struggling so much to get the COVID-19 vaccine because uh, there is a lot of competition internationally that is well recognized. But when it comes down locally, it's not a priority for our development partners because they know that even they within their countries, they need the vaccine. So until our governments within themselves, even beyond worrying about the funding for NGOs and uh, problems that they may have, uh, maybe externally driven agendas, but what about our governments? It has to begin with us as a country. Our government cannot allow our healthcare system to be um, majorly reliant on, for, on development partners for funding. So that is something and that is a trend that needs to change. And the only way that it can be reversed is for us to begin to prioritize things that are important. We need to prioritize health. We need to prioritize education. We need to prioritize things that matter and make the lives of people better every single day, instead of prioritizing the protection of perhaps a regime. So for me, I think even beyond arguing whether the existence of an NGO is necessary or not, I think beyond that, the most important thing is the existence of our government and the fact that our government is self-funded. If it is self-funded, then it can set its agenda. It can set its priorities and it can better regulate and organize NGOs. But if it is not funded on its own, then there is no it can regulate even NGOs. Uh, for example, just recently within our country, they shut down one of our biggest donor agencies, which is the DGF. 
and uh, very many NGOs are struggling because their budgets were cut, but also people lost their jobs. But also DGF was not funding only NGOs, it was also funding the government and very many programs in terms of provision of pro bono legal aid services, in terms of uh, government's issues. But uh, they just shut it down and all those programs and processes came to a halt. So actually, I think, I, I think actually we'll, we'll, we'll take this conversation to the uh, first, uh, when we come back, we'll pretty much talk yeah. more about some of the things that you have raised, some of those things that Charles has also raised and see, uh, you know, a bit of law, a bit of culture, a bit of morality in the mix of this whole talk about global gag rule. That's when we return. You know, since the global gag rule was reintroduced in 2017, uh, there's been 750,000 more unintended deaths. That's how they couch it. And 200,000 additional unsafe abortions in Ghana alone, West of Africa. So reproductive health service providers at the community level have had to leave with paucity of funds and operate on lean budgets. Young women on the continent have turned to unsafe ways of getting rid of their pregnancies. The argument of critics of the global gag rule is that it is rendering more women helpless when they get pregnant. It is limiting their reproductive choice and uh, with many African nations bringing up legislations that support safe abortion for women, they have been held back by the global gag rule. US President Joe Biden has uh, reintroduced a policy that promotes women, reproductive health, with pro-life advocates criticizing the move. Well, we're back again digging deep into all of this. Uh, Charles and Rose uh, are my guests today on the show. Uh, let me start with Charles. You know, when President Trump reenacted the global gag rule, uh, legislations for abortions were grounded to a halt uh, because nations feared they wouldn't have funds. Now, it's been revoked. Will these legislations go ahead? What do you think? Uh, I think it would be very unfortunate if the legislation uh, to expand abortion goes ahead because of foreign money. Because uh, definitely it is we as the people in Africa who should decide for ourselves what are our laws on the question of abortion and uh, right to life, reproductive health, and all the matters that are related thereby. If the money comes from foreign sources uh, to persuade our members of parliament, our local legislatures, uh, legislators to pass certain laws, that would clearly be undermining our legislative sovereignty as Africa. It would be a, a, a bit of a different argument if you were saying that uh, uh, the African countries of their own initiative are interested in passing these laws. But I think what we have seen is that when the foreign money doesn't come in in the form of carrot and stick uh, of foreign pressure, the African countries seem rather comfortable with their current anti-abortion laws. And, and uh, of course, we know there are also a few Western countries that have uh, strong anti-abortion laws, like Chile had uh, strong anti-abortion laws and so on. And some of them had quite high levels of, uh, uh, quite high levels of maternal health and very low maternal mortality levels. Chile, Ireland had some of the lowest levels in uh, South America and Europe respectively, even though they had very strong uh, laws to protect uh, the unborn life of the child. So, so I think it's not uh, necessarily true that expanding access to abortion increases maternal health. But it is also true that there are two very deeply entrenched camps on this question, there's one that supports uh, abortion rights as part of reproductive health choices for women. And there are some that think that uh, having access to abortion actually 
uh, degrades women, actually takes away their dignity. And, and this is uh, a legal, it's a cultural, it is a moral question. And I don't think it is a question that should be decided by foreign money, but by Africans themselves debating and discussing amongst themselves. So that the presence of money from America or the absence of money from America should have no impact if you think about it as a legal purist in the determination of African countries on whether to strengthen, to weaken, or to retain their uh, anti-abortion laws. You know, you know, Charles, listening to you, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, African governments have put, you know, the fate of reproductive liberty of African women in the hands of American politicians. Does that also, you know, resonate with you? I, I think uh, what happens with African governments and African politicians, they are trying to survive with the other challenges that they are facing, their politics, uh, we have corruption, we have so many issues that they are trying to deal with. And, and sometimes, uh, because of course even our, our economic levels are lower than those in the West, uh, we, we may not pay so much attention to some of these uh, human rights issues until we are reminded by those in Western countries. And when they remind us, sometimes they remind us about very important issues, like avoid re political repression, uh, avoid uh, clamping down on political demonstrations, please al uh, allow uh, uh, humane evictions uh, for people in informal settlements. So, so they actually have very useful priorities and they remind our governments to be more humane. But sometimes their, their human rights priorities actually conflict directly with the traditional African values or African cultural values. And so then you have two camps uh, in Africa when, when this man is concerned. There are some who say, no, this is part of, of becoming progressive, that you also need to liberalize our laws on abortion and on other moral questions. I, I mentioned matters to do with divorce, matters to do with LGBT. There, there are a number of moral questions that tend to be packaged together. And then you have other African uh, politicians and people in civil society who say, no, we are ready to accept your money when your priorities align with our values. But when your priorities do not align with our values, keep keep off, keep your money to you. So, so I think American politicians have realized that on this issue of abortion and the question of uh, right to life and reproductive health, there, there is a deep uh, debate in Africa and the Americans should keep off because that is our sovereign matter. And I think that is the mentality of the Republicans that let's not allow our money to go and influence that debate. Let the Africans carry out the debate as Africans. And we've seen when the foreign money is not there, then a majority of Africans, by and large, it's a super majority, are happy with our current anti-abortion laws. It's only a small minority that would like to change them. So that small minority then really pushes for the foreign money so that it can give them some more weight to effectively push to change the law. So it's it's really a debate within Africa and different groups in Africa hoping to receive resources from the West mm -hmm. to strengthen their argument because ultimately it's a democratic and political argument. Will you persuade uh, your fellow citizens to change the laws? And for me, I think it's not just a democratic and human rights argument. It's a moral argument. What is the right thing to do? And, and, and there are deep divisions on this issue. Some of them are religious. Some of them are based on legal philosophy, on ideology, and so on. Okay. But the one thing I say we cannot uh, disagree is that Africans should be the one to decide their laws for themselves. You know, uh, uh, listening to you, what uh, I see there uh, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, lobbying from the outside continent happening within, you know, the lawmakers, you know, in the continent, which many find hard to believe is happening. Rose, help us here. You know, in Africa, everyone has agreed that the woman and the girl child, just like every human being, has a right to life. 
and there are you know terminologies like you know when the woman's life is at risk unintended abortion how can we say at what point can you have an unintended abortion who gives you know the all clear uh, for that to be so tempted that this is an unintended abortion that is threatening the life of the mother help us here because you're dealing with these people uh, you know in your uh, ngo group uh, how do you arrive at that so that uh, whatever you're doing falls within the ambit of that definition of unintended abortion Uh, first of all, I just wanted to point out that the right to life is not I think uh, we ha we have a glitch in uh, the connection there to Rose. Uh, well, I think uh, well, I'll come back to you. I hope uh, as soon as we get that, I'll come back to you. Let me go back to uh, Charles. Charles, uh, um, if you heard what I asked. Uh, uh, Rose, we're, we're trying to look at you know some of those key issues you raised at uh, in your opening uh, remark. You did say everyone has a right uh, to life, and if we put all rights uh, on a scale, that to right uh, to life uh, is sits atop, so it's premium. So we'll ask in the question: At what point do we arrive? Uh, at that decision to say one life is at risk for another to go out so that one leaves. Okay, so uh, that's a very important question and a very useful question uh, because that is now the realm of medicine. Uh, medical experts, doctors, obstetrician, gynecologists, and other experts have been trained to know when there is grave and imminent danger to the life of the mother arising as a result of pregnancy. And there are conditions like uh, eclampsia or preeclampsia. Sometimes you have conditions like uterine cancer when uh, a woman is pregnant that can endanger her life. The interesting thing is that in some Western countries, they have so advanced their practice of uh, obstetric medicine and management of some of these health risks for pregnant women that they hardly ever have situations where a pregnant woman cannot be managed through a medical situation until the unborn child becomes viable and then they would induce early uh, uh, labor and the child would have a chance to survive. So in some countries like Chile and Ireland, they were able to do this. Of course, in Africa, our standards of medical care are not as high as in some of these European countries. However, the interesting thing is that when the debate on liberalizing abortion takes place, it deals with 99% of abortions which are abortions on request otherwise called abortions on demand. 99%, I would even say 99.9%, .9%, these are the statistics, are abortions that are done not because the doctor has said we need this abortion for medical reasons, but because of social reasons. Maybe the, the, the mother is asking for an abortion, maybe she's under pressure from the father, maybe there was some incest, some rape, there's some cover-up happening. So, so this 99% of cases are the ones that are causing the debate in Africa on the question of abortion. And uh, in, in the Western world, when they talk about liberalizing abortion laws, they are talking about the 99%. Because even right now in Africa, for that 1% of cases where medical reasons uh, uh, lead to a medical determination to terminate pregnancy, already that happens. And our laws allow it. And, and I can say coming from Kenya and as a lawyer that uh, most of the countries in Africa that were colonized by the British, uh, we, we have the same model penal code. 
and it has the same exception. This came from the Indian Penal Code, that in cases where uh, there is danger to the life of the mother or even of the child, then no one can be penalized in criminal law by taking a medical decision. And I know that even in Francophone Africa, you have similar principles. So, so the 1% of abortion cases that are for medical reasons, those ones are not the, the area or the realm of debate. The debate is really on abortion on demand. Uh, let between me, let those, me bring uh, Rose on here. The moral side. Now that I see that Rose is back, let me bring Rose here. Rose, uh, uh, you heard Charles. Do you agree? Uh, to a certain extent, I would agree in terms of sovereignty, but I also just wanted to point out in terms of saying that African countries have actually sat down and debated the issue of abortion, and we can see some of their conclusions when it comes to the Maputo Protocol and Article 14, where they allow for access to abortion. And certain instances, okay. especially medical abortion, is to allow women accent as and when it is available. But again, we have to note you know, uh, I think you know there are nights or there are times where the you know the internet connection. Uh, this is what COVID uh, has given to us. Uh, the good that we can speak to you from uh, Lagos, Nigeria, in faraway Nairobi, Kenya. But uh, sometimes there's a glitch in the connection. Apologies, uh, Rose. I will blame that on uh, the you know connection from Lagos to Nairobi or Nairobi to Lagos, but. Uh, uh, we go back to you, Charles. Charles, uh, you've just uh, shared the honest nest, and uh, uh, the big issue here is that uh, it seems uh, that uh, from what you have just highlighted, uh, a larger percentage of those who have gone ahead. Uh, uh, I see Rose, Rose is back. We can allow you to go ahead and finish uh, you know, your thoughts. Go ahead, Rose. Yes, I was just stating that uh, the African countries within themselves have uh, by and large debated the issue of uh, abortion and the right to abortion and access to safe and legal abortion services. And there are some resolutions that have been made, but we also see some of their quotes within the Maputo Protocol that was passed by the African Union. Uh, this charter uh, rightly spells out the rights of women and under article 14 they say that women should have a right to access safe and uh, legal abortion as and when they need it but specifically for certain instances when they can be able to do that so this is not an issue that has never been uh, debated or actually touched upon by African countries, they have done it. Maybe, maybe because of, your, of the connection, the right you, didn't, you didn't get, sorry Rose, uh, sorry to butt in here, maybe you didn't get what Charles said. I actually wanted you to react to what he said, that about 99% of those who uh, go ahead uh, to get abortion uh, on the continent did so uh, because of some maybe stigma social issues and the likes and not because it was actually uh hindering endangering their health i i don't think that within itself is correct because uh the decision to have an abortion is not an easy one or something that women take lightly and to to put it to a level of saying that maybe they did it because they, they just, like, it's just out of a whim or something of that sort is erroneous within itself. That is not correct. Most of the time, these procedures are taken to save the life of a mother, with, be it her mental health, be it her physical health. Uh, that within itself is up for debate. But at the same time, uh, it raises questions of, uh, uh, when is an abortion allowed? Is it only to save the life of a mother? When you look... Again, I think uh, we, we lost that. Uh, Charles, uh, but again, I think we, we, we got uh, uh, 
uh, the direction uh, where uh, Rose is headed. Uh, she still thinks that uh, uh, you're not right. She still thinks that uh, it takes uh, uh, a lot from uh, uh, the African woman uh, to say she wants an abortion and it's not because of some of those issues you highlighted. Uh, you know, do you do you think that uh, how did you first how did you arrive at that percentage? Uh, have you done your own research? Does that actually uh, come as a result of a research carried out by you or your group? Okay, so first let me say that uh, these statistics are actually not just in Africa. They are, they are found also in Western countries. In fact, one of the organizations that uh, is very strong in doing abortions is called International Planned Parenthood Federation. And they are the largest abortion provider in the world. Uh, in America, their sister organization is called Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And they have a partner research arm called the Alan Gatmacher Institute, which does research and even their own research has recognized that uh, most abortions that are sought by women, when I say most, I don't mean 55% or 60, a super majority are sought for social reasons. In fact, they did a survey, and I've read uh, the results of one of their survey, where some of the reasons why uh, women in America were, were having abortions was I needed to go to the beach, I need my body to look good, because the moment abortion becomes widely available, you cheapen the value of life. And this is what happens in a culture where uh, abortion is available on demand. No one can question the reason why you want an abortion, whether it is because uh, you feel that you want to advance your career and a child will interfere with your career. Maybe you feel that you're not, uh, you don't want to get married or to settle down, or you've broken up with your boyfriend and you're still pregnant. So there are all kinds of reasons, including, interestingly, peer pressure from men so if the man who impregnated the woman doesn't want the child or the father of the pregnant woman, they put pressure on the woman not to have the child. Actually, uh, these statistics have been found in several surveys. And, and in Africa, it is even worse because some of the situations where abortions happen are to cover up actual crimes like incest, like defilement or uh, uh, senior people, old people having sex with minors and then the minors become pregnant or rape and so on. So, so these are realities. I would also say that uh, our, uh, a, no, a number of organizations that uh, I know have done research in Africa and we found that uh, the statistics mirror largely what is happening in the West. It's very difficult to get exact statistics, but I've even been involved in court cases as a lawyer where we had the doctors testifying in, in Nairobi, Kenya, about the experience with abortions and what are the reasons people are having abortions. And interestingly, a majority of abortions now uh, happening in Africa are not even surgical abortions. They are chemical abortions using the abortion pill that people are getting freely in pharmacy shops without prescriptions, contrary to the law. And then you have, of course, uh, in countries like South Africa, uh, training of nurses and clinic officers to use suction pumps. They are called manual vacuum aspirators. So they, they, are, they are widely available and it, it therefore makes, uh, makes uh, the situation of having abortion not one where the, the necessarily the woman has thought very seriously about it because when abortion becomes an easily acceptable issue, it's like taking a panadol. And, and that is why uh, there's, there is this uh, moral group in Africa that are saying, uh, let us beware of allowing abortion on demand or abortion on request in Africa. Abortion should not be uh, the decision of the woman because I want to have a, an abortion, but based on a medical determination of the doctor that, yes, this will endanger the life of the mother. And those are uh, a very small uh, percentage of Absolutely. the actual cases having abortions. Well, Charles uh, Kanjama, uh, advocate of the High Court of Kenya, managing partner, uh, Muma and Kanjama advocates, would like to thank you for your time. And of course, uh, Rose Wakikona, who is a senior program officer, 
Center for Health and Human Rights and Development. Uh, many thanks again. Apologies, uh, Rose, for that uh, very ugly connection. Uh, uh, we were almost being gagged from listening to you uh, this night. Uh, you know, the Global Gag Rule has been an interesting discussion here on Village Square Africa. And we will always bring you closer to the most important topics on New Central TV. It is Africa Fest, and that's why we're looking at what concerns you. Many thanks again, uh, Charles and Rose. You can watch us live on youtube.com forward slash New Central TV and on Star Times at channel 274. You can also check the latest updates on Africa on, Af on newcentral.africa. I'm Sulaiman. I'll see you again tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.